Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you have called us to yourself. We don't take that lightly. We didn't create ourselves. We don't save ourselves. But the fact that we can hear your voice through the gift of others is so precious to us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, Steve and Brett and Brian and Trey and Bill would give of themselves throughout a year. Thank you that our church would deploy four elders and a young adult leader in this task. Thank you that we have started the journey of discipleship in such a serious way. Now be pleased, O oh Lord, to confirm the faith that has begun in us, that we might know for sure that your Holy Spirit is within us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, scripture lesson is from 1 Peter 3.15. Listen to God's word. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Give a reason for the hope that is within you. Just a minute, the confirmation students will be professing their faith. But I think it might be interesting, I hope. I want to tell you a bit about how this happened for me. For I too went through confirmation. My confirmation was a bad one. But thankfully, not long afterwards, things got made up. I want to tell you about that. But I want to think first about the old illustration of the Grand Canyon. And it is, you know, almost a mile across at some places. And people have always wondered, is there some way I can propel myself across the Grand Canyon? You know, the greatest Olympic jumper could take a running broad jump and leap out across into the canyon, and the best jump ever, he'd go about 29 feet to the bottom. Perhaps maybe the greatest cycler of all time could get a ramp and go cycling across and go as fast as he could, 50 miles an hour, hit the air of the Grand Canyon and get maybe 100 feet. Maybe even someone on a motorcycle with a great ramp could get zero to 60 in five seconds and go shooting over the Grand Canyon. They'd maybe get, oh, I don't know, generously a quarter of a mile. Doesn't really matter, does it? Because a mile is a long way. And you're not getting across the Grand Canyon by human propulsion on your own. You need something else. I think the same is true for us as people. I was pondering the fact that the fact of our sense of not connecting to God, it doesn't matter whether you are a common test cheater or a master jewel thief, whether you have the literal blood on your hands of a murder or simply because you've slain someone with your words. It doesn't matter if you feel separated from God because you were raised by hostile atheist parents or because just as a person you haven't yet come to know Christ. Separation is still separation and the difference between us and ourselves and being right with God is so great it doesn't really matter how far we get on our own. So when I tell you some of my story, I'm not going to tell you stories of murdering people at 10th, 5th grade. I didn't do that. I was a pretty good kid. I'm not going to tell you that I was raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as an atheist somewhere in a faraway place. I wasn't. I was raised in the church. And my story of not connecting with God can seem almost trivial, the things that prevented me from Him. But here's the deal. Sin, separation from God, is separation from God. And it can be as simple as kissing Marianne Swanko under the basement of Tom Pepper's house or murdering someone because it's all about what's in the heart. Yes, I did do that. Marianne Swanko and me playing spin the bottle, fifth grade, under the house. It was pretty fun. And then I felt pretty bad because I thought, I'm not sure I'm supposed to do that. And in fact, I think I feel guilty before God, and I don't know what to do with the fact of my guilt. So I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, how do I get connected to God? Because I figured if I don't feel right, maybe God can fix that. And my mom was a great mom because I liked her because she always believed in me, always believed in me. But sometimes that's not helpful because she just said, Oh, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. You'll just know when you, when you need to know. Well, that seems very reassuring, doesn't it? Thanks, Mom, but you're not helping me. I feel not connected to God. I want to be connected. I was also on a spiritual quest. I was a kid that wanted to know. Before there was God, what was there? What's the God of the universe like? I had a spiritual nature. I was questing for Him at an early age. 
but I wasn't sure how to get on the inside with God or how to get my heart clean. Our confirmation was in seventh grade. I went to confirmation class. It was on, get this, Saturday mornings, three hours at a crack. <laughs> Only six weeks, though. Well, I was very excited about this because I thought here, the church will tell me what I need to know about God to get clean and right with God and to be on the inside with Jesus. Well, we were between pastors then, and the minister that was helping out seemed to be about 95 years old if he was a day. And he seemed very nice to us, but I didn't understand anything that he said, and confirmation didn't mean much to me. I thought, well, okay, we still have to meet with an elder. At least now I'll find out what the deal is. Now, this was a little bit of a problem because my dad was one of the elders, and I thought, they're going to find out, his friends, that I don't know God, that I'm dirty and stained and I'm not right. And he's going to be embarrassed because he's supposed to have raised me to be Christ's own. But at least they'll tell me. So I had to go in a little room with the elder. The elder took me aside, and I'm thinking, here it comes. Here's the questions I can't answer. How do I know God? I don't know. And all he did was he slapped me on the back. Son, so good when people are interested in the church. Welcome aboard. Well, at first I was relieved. I thought, okay, fine, I'm out of here. It's done. They didn't expose me. And then I was mad. I thought, is that it? Is that all you got? Is that all the church has? You can't tell me how to get clean in my heart, how to get on the inside with Jesus Christ? Confirmation kids have been suffering ever since. I've been determined now that I'm a pastor, the confirmation students that I have influence over will hear about Jesus, how he forgives our sins, and how we can get on the inside with him. Well, it didn't work for me in confirmation. I still felt like I was on a quest. I wanted to know God on the inside, really, truly, to feel like I had everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, rightness inside me. Well, in my eighth grade year, I had some friends that went off to a church camp. They came back to our youth group, and they were really excited. They said, hey, we met Jesus. You need to know him too. And I said, this is wonderful. What do I have to do? They said, it's simple. You trust in him to be your Savior and Lord. Okay, I said, how do I do that? Well, you have to invite him to be first in your life. You just give over everything to him. He comes into your heart and saves you. It's like, well, okay, but does that mean like, you know, my girlfriend too? Holly Nestor, eighth grade. I'm telling you, it was pretty serious. We had pondered what our first child might be named. Should we get married? And they said, well, yeah, it's no big deal. I mean, just give your life to Christ. Put him first. I said, you don't understand. Holly Nestor doesn't believe in God. She doesn't. And if I become a religious guy, she's going to dump me. And my friend said, as only eighth grade friends can say, fine, don't worry about it. You're going to hell. Get over it. I was like, What? So yeah, you need Jesus to cleanse you of your sins and to get right with God. It's like, well, I can't do it. I can't give her up. I love her too much. She's great. She's got this long red hair. She's beautiful. Leopard skin top. Oh, man, she was so gorgeous. I said, that's all right. You'll never know God then if you can't give up control of your life to him. So I struggled. I was in a wrestling match with the Lord. I could not find a way that I could release my life to him and find the forgiveness and the closeness that I was seeking. And then it happened miraculously. I was at church camp, summer camp, and the counselor, who's a high school student, was sharing how he knew Jesus, and he said, so, is God working in your heart now to enable you to give, you, give him your life? And all of a sudden, I thought, yes, okay. Even if it cost me Holly Nestor, I'll do it. It was like a gift to me. And I said, I receive you. I receive your forgiveness. You be Lord of my life. And I got this sense of being filled with God's presence. I stopped feeling guilty about Mary Ann Swanko and Holly Nestor because I knew that Christ had taken all my sins. And those seem like silly sins, right? But there's no difference. The Grand Canyon gap is still a gap, whether it's murder or smooching Marianne Twanko. Doesn't make any difference. It's still our separation problem, and Christ had bridged it. He'd laid his cross down over the chasm, and I could walk across. 
And suddenly reading the scriptures came alive to me. And suddenly I realized Christ meant more to me than anything. And yes, Holly Nestor dumped me. She dumped me as soon as she got back from vacation and found out what the deal was. And it was okay. It hurt. But I found out something else about the Christian life. The peace that passes understanding. There's nothing in the world that can prevent us from sadness and loss. But the hope of having Christ in your heart is that there's a peace, that all is really well and God is with you no matter what. I had to find that out early in my Christian life. So for me, it turned out to be what I've been looking for for several years, a sense of forgiveness, a sense of being filled up from the inside, of actually connecting to God and believing he was guiding my life and of knowing his comfort. We've met with all your students the idea was to invite each of them, if they hadn't, to make a personal profession in Christ. And they did. And their teachers have talked with them. And they've heard it at camp. We've done it in a variety of settings because it's the most important thing. And now before your family, your friends, the assembled congregation, you will confess your faith. The Apostle Paul says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. This is an important step in our salvation. Thanks be to God that he calls us to himself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of laying your cross down across the great chasm between us and your Father. Thank you for finding a way that will forgive us and give us everlasting life. And thank you for enabling us to trust you. Thank you for working faith in the lives of these students that they've given their hearts to you, that they've made you number one. You've come to dwell in them. May they rejoice now to speak their faith before this congregation. May they feel your spirit as they are confirmed. In Jesus' name, amen.